Oh yeah. What's up ladies and gentlemen and welcome to episode 32 of the Sailor Jerry podcast. My name is Matt Cawthron and if I am still your host, then Sailor Jerry spiced rum must still be made the old school way. 92 proof, bold and smooth as hell. Today is March 17th, 2022. Happy St. Patrick's Day, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone has an awesome day. I hope everyone is doing good. I hope the St. Patrick's people are St. Patrick's in. Lots going on in the world per usual. There was a solar shift. Ladies and gentlemen, Daylight Savings has done its thing once again. And although we have lost an hour of sleep, we have gained an hour of sunlight. And let me tell you what, man, that is what I needed. Because your boy has been in a little bit of a winter slumber, you know? Like, uh, you know, I don't know. I just, I, I've had some trouble snapping out of it as of late. And I feel like it was because when the sun goes down early, I, I hate it. I hate it. It's hard for me to stay motivated, uh, you know, into the night. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but then this shift happens. You get that extra hour of sunlight. The sun's out till 7, sometimes 8 p.m. Uh, and everything just feels more energized, you know? So now it's like, okay. All right, summer's coming, you know, get motivated, get inspired. Uh, Life is happening. You get the extra hour of sunlight on your face. um, And what are you going to do with it? You know, so that's good. That's a good thing. There's not too many good things happening around the world right now. But I do believe that an extra hour of sun is always a good thing. Before we get started... Want to send some extra love out to Ukraine. Keep your head up. It's time for episode 32. Elle is an artist too important to ignore. Sure, she might have made her name in the NYC graffiti and street art scene, but it's her dynamic progression into large-scale murals showcasing female empowerment that has everybody talking. In this candid and inspired episode, we talk about Elle's artistic path, creative process and the importance of female energy in the art world also up for discussion is l's first nft collection why the metaverse might be our only hope and the importance of stepping back to look at the big picture so kick back relax pour yourself some sailor jerry and let's go What's up, Elle? How's it going? It's going good. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Awesome, awesome. Where are you at today? Um, I have a little bat cave somewhere right now, um, but it's in an undisclosed location. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I had bases in New York and LA and everything, but I lost everything during COVID. So I've got one little home spot that I float around to when I'm not on the road, but I'm mostly on the road anyways. So this is my little studio area at the moment. Right on. I like that. <laughs> Address unknown. Okay. <laughs> cool. cool. Um, well, we appreciate you being on the Sailor Jerry podcast. Uh, you know, it's really awesome to get to talk to you. So thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Right on. Uh, let's, let's start uh, at the beginning. Uh, where, where did you grow up? 
So um, I actually was born in the Bay and um, lived in France for a year and then lived in Boston for a year and then moved to New York. And I was based in New York for eight years, but had a place there for maybe 14 years. So that's like my home home. And then um, I got a place in LA and was based there for a year and was working on like large scale paintings because New York, you know, the apartments are so small. I couldn't, yeah. I wanted to work on things that were like similar to size. So anyways, then I was in Melbourne for a few years and then mostly on the road traveling. So I'm a bit like, I identify mostly with New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So <laughs> when... When you were growing up, uh, you know, when did kind of art first make a mark in your life? You know, were you into drawing as a kid or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, I would draw all the time. I was always drawing. And actually, when I was applying to college, I was like, I don't know if I want to go to art school because I love it so much. That I don't want to have to depend on it for money. And, you know, because I, I was like, oh, man, that's my passion. That might ruin it for me. Um, and so I actually went to UC Davis for food science and technology. And then halfway through that, I was like, no, nah, I just want to do art. <laughs> yeah. Right on, right on. And so, you know, when you kind of first got started, um, you know, how did it how did it transition to, um, you know, from graffiti into street art? Like, how did you define your style? So I. Um, I ended up going to art school and then I dropped out and I quit art and moved to New York and just started bartending and whatnot out there. And then yeah. I saw street art for the first time, like wheat pasted stuff on walls. And I was like, oh, this is, this is really amazing. You know, cause I was really disillusioned by creating art and then having it in storage and rolled up somewhere and no one would ever see it unless you yeah. somehow found a gallery that would give you permission to show your work. And then they'd take 50. And I was just like, this whole thing is so weird. And, um, so I, I fell in love with street art and I started creating wheat paste and I started putting them up at night and putting them all over New York. And then I started getting upset that they would come off, come off the walls so quickly. And, you know, I'd spend a week painting on paper and put it up and then it would just be gone. And so I started to pay attention to the graffiti and the stencils and all of that. And I actually met a couple graffiti artists just kind of serendipitously and um, got really, really heavily into just like tagging and doing rollers and getting really heavily into graffiti, um, painting with fire extinguishers on the street. So like 30, 50 feet tall. Yeah. And just like, I chose the name L, which means she in French and just was like hitting the streets hard for the ladies, you know? Um, so then I got sponsored by a spray paint company and because they were, you know, they were like, we just want to give you free spray paint. And I was like, all right. But because <laughs> I had all this free paint, I was like, started asking people if I could paint their buildings. Cause I was like, you know, a tag's cool, but I could paint a whole building facade on the freeway and that have really good visibility. So I started doing that and then um, started getting invited to paint out around the world. And that became my job. <laughs> Yeah, that's fucking incredible. I know, you know, it, it, the history of graffiti in New York is, I mean, it's its where it all started. It's where it all went down. It's the history is amazing. It's also very serious business mm -hmm. on the streets, you know? So yeah. when you were getting into that, uh, you know, what was the vibe like? Were there any other women out there at the time, you know? A few, you know, like 17 bombs really hard. She's still going. Um there are a few that are so good and amazing that you wouldn't even know, you know, they bomb all black and white. And unless yeah. you knew it was who you wouldn't know it was female or not, but there were not as many for sure. Like very few women in the scene, really uh, less so with wheat pasting and whatnot, but in the graffiti scene, definitely fewer illegal writers. Um, but I think that's changing a little bit. I think it's becoming a little bit more, you know, I mean, I understand there are, there are dangerous situations and it's late at night and jail is a huge deterrent. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. So I understand people not wanting to get into it for that reason. Right on. What, uh, what bummed you out about art school? Um, I was really into painting super poppy flat things and they were like, look at Rembrandt. And I was yeah. like, I hate Brown. I don't like, they just, we were talking different languages, you know, and then they'd come in the studio and they'd be like, 
well, you're going to prom, but you forgot your prom dress and prom shoes. I'm like, that's great, but that's really not helpful. And the critique was just like, this is not, you know, so ambiguous and stupid. And there was this, this war between all the female and male staff that was just getting involved with the students. And it was just like, I think the program itself was having issues. And I was just yeah. like, this is not, this is not what I'm feeling. So that was, that was like the first time I quit art. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the first, the, the first, first time. Hopefully, and hopefully it'll times. be the last. Yeah, yeah there's yeah, yeah. already happened again a couple times. Where I'm like, I'm done. I quit art, <laughs> and then I always end up doing it again. I don't know. Yeah, how do you, um, you know, the modern world is so cool in regards to people having access to, uh, to your art and to buy your art and things like that. But there's also kind of a, a push and pull. Um, you know, with the acceptance of galleries and things like that. And I was wondering how, uh, where you sit on that, on that fence, because it is interesting, like you're saying galleries, they take 50%, but it's almost like, like a band getting signed to a label. There's a certain amount of acknowledgement and a, a next level step that sure. galleries like, you know, that galleries give you. But I mean, when you paint something and you could sell it hundred percent to someone who loves your art online, you know, from Instagram or whatever, verse hanging it in the gallery and losing 50% of it. Where do you, you know, where do you, yeah, where do you sit sure. with that? I mean, it's not totally fair to say 50%. I think some galleries it's 20, 30%, some it's yeah, 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it totally depends on the artist, I think. And a lot of people that are restricted to their studios, I think a gallery can be a really great tool for them. Personally, most of my income comes from painting large scale murals. So I work a lot with property developers and, and, um, and brands and things like that. However, I have over the years developed a few relationships with different galleries like Vroom and Verso in Amsterdam that have been really amazing or KSR Gallery in Melbourne. And they've offered me the opportunity to come and live there for a month and create a show and exhibition within that month and then sell it at the end. And then also like Room and Verso, they just brought me out last month to um, right outside of Amsterdam to install in this museum. And it was hanging right next to a Basquiat and there was a key oh, bearing in the show. And I was like, oh my, literally next to my piece, the next piece over was a Basquiat. And I was like, I never thought that would happen. So I think that the caliber of experiences that you can get with the museum are different than like working with Toyota, which is really cool and a different experience. But um, as far as the art world, like the galleries are more traditional and, and that can bring something really exciting to the table as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think you're right. And, and sometimes people get wrapped up in just giving away the percentage and they don't really realize yeah what you get in return sometimes, totally. you know? And it, it really depends on the gallery and the gallerists. And I've developed friendships with them and I love going out and hanging out with these people and we're super cool now. And so the experience is totally different than what I would have thought when I was a student being like, oh, galleries, how do you even, you know, develop or, or walk in with your portfolio as the old, like, <laughs> you know, saying, but, um, it, it, you know, when you develop something naturally, I think, or, or you have aspirations to show with a really amazing gallery that has artists that you really admire, I think those can offer really special opportunities. Right on, right on. Now you mentioned murals, you've been doing a ton of murals lately. Um, how did you kind of graduate to that? Like going from street art uh, to bigger and bigger pieces, how did you kind of first um, established that you were ready to take on the murals and that was something you wanted to do? Yeah. Um, so I guess there were a couple things that were sort of landmarky along the way. One of them was my friend Bishop 203, who owns a graffiti shop in Brooklyn. Um, he invited me to come paint my first legal trailer with him and so he kind of taught me to sit there and start painting with spray paint and I started to become obsessed with the craft of not just tagging but actually working with spray paint and using it as a craft and a tool and I immediately fell in love and became obsessed with that like I had with graffiti and so I started to get really interested in sitting there and petting a wall <laughs> <laughs> and um, he also brought me to six points in um brooklyn or in queens which doesn't exist anymore but so i painted up there on the rooftop before it got demolished awesome and um, became friends with with those folks who own it marine mares and they're amazing and just started to develop this whole community within that scene and a lot of those people came from illegal writing but were painting murals for fun on the weekends or for commissions and things of that sort so um 
you know, there started to be opportunities in Bushwick, like, hey, come paint for the Bushwick block party or all these different things. And I was just excited at the opportunity to paint. But my first international job was um, a commission by Yasha Young, who, when I first met her, she came to my studio in Brooklyn and she, she was like, yo, so I'm going to start this museum. And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> That's a really great idea. But she's like, yeah, no, I'm pitching this idea. I'm going to start this huge museum and it's going to be amazing. And she fucking did. It was crazy. She built this amazing museum and she brought me out to Berlin to paint an installation the windows while they were still doing construction inside. And then she started doing all these collaborations around the world. She brought me out to Iceland to paint for Iceland Airwaves. So we did this big concert collaborative thing. So we each got paired up with one of the bands that was playing at the concert and um, took some of their lyrics and then created a visual around that. Just really amazing opportunities. Um, so there's that. And then also I used to work, I was bartending in New York, but I used to work running conferences at Goldman Sachs. I, I was in charge of all of the temp employees. So it was all, and I was a temp employee also, but they'd, you know, I'd work for them like two or three times a month and would just be like on walkie talkies with all the other temp employees. And so they'd fly me out to Chicago and different places. And I was also hair modeling at the time, which is really <laughs> a niche weird thing, but I would fly out to London and different places and do runway shows with TG and they, I have like green mohawks and crazy. Hell shows. yeah. Just like, they were like, we'll bring you out to London for a week to party. You just have to work one day, but we have to do whatever we want to your hair. And I'd be like, fuck <laughs> it. I don't care. <laughs> so when I was doing these weird random gigs, I would bring my street art and graffiti and stickers and I would start to get up all over. And so I had these opportunities to travel and put up my work. And so I think just being on the streets a lot started to like, I started to get some recognition, like name recognition maybe for, for things. So mm -hmm. that opened up a lot of doors. There's obviously, you know, there there's some females doing street art and and that's amazing. But I think what separates you is what makes you really important is you step into uh, what you believe and you share it as like almost like a sign of strength to other women that view your art on the street. You know, it's like you're not just a female doing street art. The murals that you do, uh, they have such a, a message of female empowerment. And I was wondering how do you choose the images that you're going to use? How do you dive into the messages that you want to send? I, I was looking at some of your stuff and some of the earlier things you did that I wanted to talk about was the, uh, the warrior women. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really cool how you kind of explained that, you know, you wanted them to be almost like a, a presence watching over women as they walk down the street and things like that. I thought that was really amazing. Thanks so much. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I first got into graffiti and realized there were so few females, it was as if I was stepping into yet another world that was dominated by males, which is pretty much every world and every career and everything, you know, but it's becoming less so, but I think there's still a lot of, a lot of work to be done for equality. Um, but I realized that the majority of the, the images and words and things I was seeing on the street, as I started to get to know everyone and they became my friends, I realized that they were mostly dudes. And so I felt like we needed a really strong female presence on the streets. And so I started yeah, painting and wheat pasting up these 20 foot or, you know, 10 foot tall warrior guardian ladies. And they were yeah, peaceful warriors. And they were kind of guardians of the street, kind of watching out for the ladies as they walked on. And I just thought it was really uh, important to add a female presence to the streets. And, um, you know, there are all these men everywhere and then just be like, no, this is the female space and, you know, we've got you. And then as we started to paint bigger walls, I thought it comes with a little bit of a responsibility in a way, because you have an opportunity to give a message. And so not only, I mean, not only is it important to, I think, spread a positive message or try to influence someone to do something positive in their life or, or become aware of something that's really important, but also the tradition of mural painting is, and, and public art is traditionally white males, right? So you've got uh, Christopher Columbus and you've got all these yeah, explorers, yeah, you've yeah, got yeah, the mayors yeah. or the presidents and all these white dudes in marble. And the presence of, of public art was really lacking females. And I think as a young girl walking around, if you could look up and see a woman on the wall or in a sculpture and be like, whoa, who's that? 
and, and also have that same um, idea of, oh, wow, a powerful woman, I could be like her. It really encourages young women to also get involved and become something great and know that there's a lot of opportunity. And so, um, you know, but at the same time, I very rarely paint portraits. One portrait that I have done is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but yeah. typically I, um, I avoid doing one person because I think it's really important that generally my work speaks as the all powerful female and is also very inclusive of all race, just because there are enough dudes on the street, you know? Yeah, I got it. Like, no, <laughs> no more white dudes in marble. We don't need no more white dudes in marble. No offense. <laughs> 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 no, right on. I, th I think it's really cool, you know, and I think it's awesome that you step into that role, you know, because it's like, it takes a lot of courage and strength and confidence to step in 100%. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people would say you could kind of just, you know, do anything artistically that you want to do. And, and you, you get a lot of press because you're a female doing it. But you step all the way in and your art delivers a message on top of just the artist doing it, you know? So I think it's really, really cool. Thank you. And, and a lot of that comes from learning the hard way, right? So for example, I started doing the multi-ethnic faces because I was riding my bike around um, in Harlem, putting up street art with my friend Gaia and was reaching into my bag and realizing I only had white girls. And I was like, how have I never thought? I'm so insular in my studio that I'm painting people that look just like me and not even considering the neighborhood that I work in. And so, you know, all of these things were, were steps along the way where I think doing public art has really changed my work in an important way and, and made me more cognizant of the people living there and the way people live and what people are into or not into. So I really want my work to feel like it's a gift to the people because that's what I fell in love with with street art is, oh my God, this person sacrificed their freedom to put a gift of beauty out on the street. It's just for the public to walk by and admire and, and look at. And I don't want it to feel like an imposition, like, oh, here's another white girl in our neighborhood, you know, and instead it should be researching the flora and fauna and the things that are familiar. And it should be relatable to those people and empowering no matter where it is. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's funny how, um, you know, if you, if, if, if we were just able to take that concept and think about that on a global level when it comes to equality, because it's so it, like when you think about like art, you think about work, you think about your life on a daily level, like you always should be, you know, paying attention, learning, evolving, progressing. Mm -hmm. And then it's so weird how when it comes to like, you know, politics or a global consciousness or, you know, just the overall topic of equality, like how that ideology of learning progressing you know like expanding it just stops and I, d I don't understand like where that happens yeah yeah and I mean people learn from mistakes so it's okay to make mistakes yeah and, you know and also I get criticized by a lot of my friends though that are like hey this is art and if you really want to sell a lot of art you shouldn't get involved in politics and you shouldn't be posting your feelings and emotions about these things online but I don't really care I mean <laughs> I think for me, it's just important to feel like I'm doing the morally right thing and try to, you know, if I can persuade someone to think in a way that I think is morally higher, I will, because I feel really passionate about those things, you know? Yeah, <laughs> Don't I mean, kill I, another person. I think that's really important. Um, you know, just be a good human. Things, you know, it's simple. <laughs> I, it, it is simple, but it's really it's it's hard sometimes for people to take that step because, like you're saying, they they either want to play it safe or you, they think it will affect their work in a negative way. But I think there's enough of that in the world already. You know, it's like it's so refreshing and cool to see. You know, it, it, if art is supposed to be a reflection of the times if you're not going to be someone like that, at least have the guts and the confidence to f fully say what you feel and like express who you are as a human. You know, I think that that at the end of the day is more uh, respected and identifiable. Even if it's something you're not into, you can look at it and say, okay, you know, that person is letting it all out there. And I bet you can relate to that with your music, right? Do you, I don't know if you write all of your songs or how. Yeah. 
but like you probably can identify with that on that level, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there there's a lot of, you know, it's just like anything else. There's a lot of artists out there who write songs for everyone to digest and that's cool. But there's also, there's a moment, I think, in every artist and in, in, in at least specifically talking about artists and musicians where you know the line in your head where you are, you know, sacrificing a little piece of yourself to do something for, you know, someone else or for, you know, the, you know, the industry or whatever. And it's like those lines, you know, when you cross them, it never feels good. Yeah, you know? yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> it, it never feels good. And we do, and you cross them and sometimes they're big and sometimes they're small and sometimes it's just compromise and it's not that big of a deal, but yeah. everyone's got that line in their head. And I think that that's an important thing. And like you're saying, it doesn't have to be like this crazy, like heavy thing. Like people make mistakes. Like mm -hmm. you make like one time we were, you know, when we were first got signed, we got offered to do this Burger King commercial. <laughs> and, and, and it was like, we said no to it because at the time oh. it was like, it was like this big thing, like, oh, we're not going to be part. And it, our, man, our manager was like, look, this is exactly what's going to happen. You're, you're going to do this. If you do this, then the commercial, because they're wearing these things, it's not going to see air. You're going to get the money. And it, the, no one's ever going to hear this song or see the commercial. And we're like, no, we can't do that. We got, you know, and that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Another band did it. And then the commercial <laughs> never saw the air. They got sued by some other band. And it was just, oh was my whole, God, that's so funny. It was a whole thing. Collabs, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, corporate collabs are so interesting, right? Like, yeah. Personally, I kind of love them depending on who, who you're collaborating with. I mean, it's always funny, right? Like, okay, do I identify with and can I relate to Burger King? Like, can I, can my <laughs> brand align? Like maybe yeah. can you influence someone or give someone at Burger King, like your amazing music? If you think the answer to that is yes, and you can enrich someone's life, then like, maybe sure go with it. But, but like you're saying, there's that always that line of you know, it's one thing, and it's the same for public art for me also, um, not only when I work with brands, because sometimes you'll be working with a brand like Ikea, who's like, we want to do a street art poster. Okay, cool. Like, okay, here's my first sketch. Oh, we'd really like it if it moves more in this direction of your art and sends you your art. And you're like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's really good feedback. And then there are other public murals or things where people are like, oh yeah, we don't really like that tone of yellow. And we were thinking maybe you could paint my dog's face. And you're like, <laughs> no, like, <laughs> you know, so you always have to kind of be like, okay, where is my line of this is sacrificing my integrity versus like, this is something where I'm going to work and make our brands align really well. And I'm really proud of this. And so that's always a really interesting dance as an artist and creative, I think. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think that, you know, on the corporate side of things, I, I think that, you know, a lot of corporations have really, um, you know, learned uh, a lot of times by, you know, stealing people's art and then getting sued for it, but they've learned to embrace art and embrace artists and to let them, you know, to realize that art is an asset, you know, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. art is, is something that is uh, an incredible expression of the human experience and it does nothing but elevate. And, and so, you know, on a corporate level and even, you know, with, with music and stuff like that, it's always interesting because like you're saying, it's all about, okay, like, do we align with what this is or is right. this just, you know, or is this just money or is this just whatever, you know? And then there's some people who cross that line. There's some people who don't, and it's an individual choice, it's you know, totally a personal choice. And it's also circumstantial, you know, if you're like, damn, I just bought a house and like, I would normally <laughs> say no, but I'm going to say yes to that right now. Like that's okay too. You know, people are in different circumstances. So, you know, I just try not to be judgmental and I try to make the right decisions that I think are right for me. And, you know, with the music, like you're kicking, yourself maybe for not having done that burger king gig <laughs> you know you know yeah it's uh it's it, it, it'll it'll be all right but yeah it's, it's just funny it, it's funny how you know you can place i think you know importance on things so much um you know in the micro in the moment and then you know when you step outside of it, you realize that it, it's really nothing in the grand scheme of life and in the grand scheme of your work too, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. I, I think one of the things that was super interesting to me about uh, murals, and I want to talk with you about is like, you know, the actual workflow of it, because there's so much, you know, like you've done some huge pieces of work, you know, so it's like, when you're in that moment, 
I think it's a lot like life where you have to, you know, you have to remember to take a step back and look at the big picture. Yeah. So I actually painted my largest piece to date uh, last year, which was 10,000 square feet. Wow. And yeah. And I don't really work with assistants at all. So like I said, it's all a learning experience. So I showed up to the wall with, you know, 800 spray cans and was like, <laughs> I got this. And basically I took the first spray paint and went like this on the wall. And it was like a little pencil drawing, a little pencil line on a wall like that. And I was like, oh, this is not going to work. You know, this is going to take me years. So I had to rent a paint sprayer and learn how to use a paint sprayer and learn how to paint with a paint sprayer and how to mix colors with a paint sprayer. And it was really learning and trying to adjust my process to what the, what the job was. But, um, typically it's not typically that's not the situation but it's always you know adjusting and learning with the situation but the way that I create my work is always begins on photoshop actually so I collage okay. together a sketch and some of it is found imagery and some of it is my own and some of it is from paintings that I've done or created in the studio and I collage together an image and then the actual painting part depending on the size of the building is generally pretty quick and um I just, you know, I work on scissor lifts and boom lifts and, um, and then just kind of go for it. And I, I love the process of seeing it evolve. So you go up and you sketch it with spray paint and then you step back and you're like, okay, that looks really bad. And then you, you're like, okay, let me fix this and this. And it's really, it's an evolving process, but I think I don't work like a lot of artists that just kind of print along a, a, a what do you call it? A diagram or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because I, I'm really bad at math and I'd be like, one, three, five, wait, what block am I on? You know, like my brain just doesn't work like that. And I also, I like the challenge. I think I tried projecting my, one of my first walls and I was in the way of the projector and I was like, this is dumb and didn't really like that. But I think it's a cool challenge and it's much more satisfying at the end if you can kind of figure it out as you go it's such a large scale project, you know, and it's yeah. like, there, there is a fair amount of like a learning curve organization. Like, how do you attack it? You know, cause yeah. it's, 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 it's pretty overwhelming. And then as you're doing it, do you, you know, do you care if, if people are coming up, do you get people talking to you as you're doing stuff like this? So most of the time I'm on scissor and boom lifts where I'm yeah. up above, I'll be like five stories tall or something. So yeah. you definitely can't Sorry. hear people can't at hear all, <laughs> <laughs> but there are a few projects where I am, you know, it's like short, long buildings and you're on bottom level and normally it's fine. But for example, the vessel I had, I think 10 days to paint that by contract by the time we started painting, because they kept being wanting sketch revision, sketch revision, sketch revision. And by the time I painted it, and I think that one was yet yeah, 3000 square feet or something. And, um, or five or eight. Okay. Now I don't remember. Anyways, it was big and, um, it rained fully downpoured rained for two Ooh. full days. And I tried and, the, and it, it just like, there was no way I could paint it. So, um, it was down to eight days. And at that point, and I like, this dude, my friend now, Zooey, showed up and was like, put me to work. I can help you. And they came down and they were like, no one can touch the wall because you're the only one on the insurance here. So you, they can't do anything. So, you know, he was like, I'm going to go get you a little handheld paint sprayer. And that was the first time I used a paint sprayer because I was just like, how am I going to get this whole thing done in eight days? And people would come up to try to talk to me. And I'd be like, don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, I mean, I've got, I wear a full face mask most of the time and it's got oh, a respirator yeah, 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 and I've got yeah. gloves on and I kind kind of look like an astronaut and so it's kind of funny because sometimes people will look at me and talk about me or my artwork thinking that I can't hear because it looks like I have a lot of stuff in me <laughs> but I'm like I can hear you <laughs> but I think it's generally a deterrent for people to talk to me and then you know sometimes I'll just be like I'm sorry I'm, I'm really in a rush can't chat but like maybe later <laughs> but no, if I'm not on such time crunch then you know, I, I think that dialogue can be really nice when I'm on ground level. Yeah, because it's really cool, especially with with your work, you know, obviously, because it is something worth talking about, you know, so I imagine that that space is kind of funny when you're trying to work and people are like, oh, yeah, what, who are you? What are you doing? And you're just like, yeah, oh. or <laughs> it's really weird, actually, when people demand your attention, though, or, you know, people will come up and be like, you'll be on the ladder painting. And they'll come up to you and be like, excuse me, could you move out of the way for my picture? And you're like, 
I am literally in my office working right now. Like, can you imagine if someone walked into your office and was like, excuse me, could you please get out of your desk? I'd like to do a little fun <laughs> photo shoot in here. And you're like, what? So <laughs> it can be kind of absurd. Like, I think the public sometimes wants to engage authentically and sometimes they're, they can be a little clueless. <laughs> Yeah, 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 straight up. All right, switching from uh, the streets to the uh, to the screen. Let's talk about NFTs. Let's yeah. talk about NFTs. You recently uh, just launched your first NFT collection, Peaceful Warriors, which is super awesome and very exciting for you. Congratulations! Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the NFT space? Um, and is the future of art digital? I love the NFT space. I still feel very ignorant in it. I'm learning so much, um, but I, I've been deep diving for a while and it's just like a bottomless pit of things to learn, you know, as far as in on every level, how to deal with it once you get ETH, how to get the ETH in there, how to open and start yeah. everything, but then also how to manage wallets and cold wallets and hot wallets and security and all of the things, right? What to invest in, what not to invest in, which platform is the best. So it's been a really big puzzle trying to sort through everything, but I'm the type of person that kind of throws caution to the wind and I just like to jump into things and learn about them that way. So I'm not a big research and figure everything out and then do it. I'm more like throw everything at the wall and see what sticks and just try it because I think I get excited and anxious that I'll miss out. And so um, yeah, I was like, all right, let's just do this. I like the idea of OpenSea because everyone can, everyone can get on it. It's an open platform and I just want to do it. And so, um, you know, I, I do think it is going to be the future of art in that this is the first opportunity for, for musicians and artists and creatives that when their work gains popularity and is able to sell for more money in the future or, um, you know, gets more listens or gets sold for a million dollars 10 years later, you don't get zero dollars of that. You're able to get a percentage of that sale. Even if it's only 10%, that's a huge, it's like you have stock in the company that you created, right? Yeah. Which is fair for the first time in history. And so I think that's just a wonderful, really, really cool thing. Um, you know, and I think I would like to, and I think that every artist should tie in their, their real physical artworks with NFTs when they sell them so that they come together as a package somehow in contract. And as that piece, the physical piece is sell as well, you get a percentage of those sales, 10% with the NFT. I really do think that that's the future of art and music and, and creative things in order to pay the creators in the correct manner. I think it's really, really cool, the NFT space. And I know a lot of artists are doing a lot of really cool things. And I, I think for me, you know, NFT space, the digital art world, I'm all in like the metaverse and just living with goggles on. I'm not into that. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, wait. We have to talk. <laughs> Are you into the metaverse? I'm buying in the metaverse oh, like no. this month. I'm so excited. I've been trying to get my funds up in ETH. I'm like, okay, I want to sell as many NFTs as I can to purchase. I want to get one property in every, every land because I'm like, bro, I was trying to buy last when was it it was like july of last year i was trying to get a property in in um in the metaverse and crypto voxels for like four hundred dollars and i was like i don't really know how this works i'm trying to figure it out but i have yet to buy and now the minimum is like five thousand dollars the opportunity cost here, like the opportunity that, uh, to financially gain and also that you can have a gallery there and sell things and create your own space. Like there's so much opportunity. I think it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, I think that's the one thing I haven't quite wrapped my head around yet is because yeah. there's like, because the, Web 3.0 is, is, you know, basically uh, uh, an all inclusive, you know, self-contained universe where everything is for sale pretty much, you know? So, yeah. but in my mind, I don't know, it's already like that in a way, you know? So it's like with the NFTs, like I get having, wanting to have a digital gallery, but I don't really understand wanting to have like a, a digital life. I guess, okay, so I, I understand that and I feel that. And I think right now it's really basic building blocks. Like right now it's pretty shitty. You wouldn't want to spend time in there very much because it looks really bad and it's all pixelated. But I think in the future, 
and I'm going to be a little bit of a pessimist here, but considering the pandemic and global yeah. warming and all the fires in California where you can't even go outside half the year and all of the extreme heat that's going to be in the East Coast and, you know, all of these different things that are happening on our planet where we actually are confined to our homes and have to be alone. I think the metaverse offers amazing opportunity to actually have community that feels much more authentic um, than this. You know, I think this yeah. is a very isolating um, tool and very um, primitive in a way, you know, with the Apple watches and all these little things where we have to be like this instead of being in an immersive opportunity. And so I think for classrooms and things like that, it's actually going to be incredible to sit in there and be able to have a real live dialogue sitting next to your friends and whatever. So I, I understand, but I don't think, I mean, we're already on our things so much that I don't think it's going to be more. I think it's going to be different. You know what? I, I can see that. That makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So I get that parcel now because pretty soon it's going to be like <laughs> New York prices. And you're going to be like, damn, it's a million dollars for this building. It was like $200 three years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. I gotta, I gotta, you know, I'm working my way into the metaverse because it's a trip too. Cause obviously, you know, music art, it's like, you know, you always want to be, um, you know, you always want to be tuned into what's happening around you and what's happening in the future. You know, yeah, like yeah. I see a lot of bands that just, you know, they're so just like middle finger to like progress in the future. And you're like, dude, what are you doing? You know, yeah. but, yeah. <laughs> but it's, I mean but, Go ahead. I would love to have your band come and like play in my gallery for my first metaverse opening. <laughs> Wouldn't that be dope? Yeah, I uh, yeah, but so yeah, that's so that but that's where that's happening. That's where it's going. Justin Bieber yeah. played a metaverse concert. It's all. I mean, it's all going there. You know. Yeah. So I'm into it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that's going to happen. I mean, and that's crazy that you think, you know, one of the things you just said that kind of hit home is, you know, you can't help but think about the impact of what's happening in the world, like currently, and just how fucked things are. And maybe it's, it's not about people global. wanting to, yeah. yeah, people wanting to like live in, you know, an, uh, an, an immersive internet, but people honestly, you know, maybe 30, 40 years from now, not really having a choice. Yeah. I mean, look at the kids right now in school after a few years is still whatever. And they have to sit here looking at a, a TV screen, you know, a, a computer screen when they could be walking around a classroom or walking around in the nature, learning about birds and bees, like actually looking at the plants in a forest, exploring and learning that way. I just think there's a lot of untapped potential. Right on, right on. Well, that's awesome. I appreciate your thoughts on that. Super excited about your, uh, about your NFT set. And it's really cool. You know, a lot of people still, you know, I had some guy talk to me the other day and he was like, you know, NFTs are bullshit. You know, what do you think like Warhol would think about NFTs? I'm like, dude, Warhol would have loved oh, this shit. Are you kidding me? There'd be, a, there'd, be a, there'd be a thousand Maryland's. There'd be a thousand no. Maryland's. You know, totally. be, it was like, totally. come on, you know, but yeah, it's, it, there's still so much to, to discover and, and to happen. And and uh, one artist, uh, Thank You X, was doing the infinite objects inside physical, uh, inside physical painting. So that's yeah. kind of the, the mix of that is really cool, too, that you touched on. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity in the next couple of years also, or a lot of physical products where you can bring the NFT actually into your house and have real nice displays and things of that sort. So I think there's, you know, the whole thing is going to shift, I think, the art world and, and the way people hang art and experience art. So, right on, right on. I wanted to talk about uh, workflow a little bit with you because no. you are uh, a busy human being. You're doing a lot of different things. Uh, you have the collaboration with ASICS that I just saw with Steve Aoki. That's pretty cool. You got murals all over the world. How do you, uh, you know, I, I like talking to people about how they spend their time, like to keep yourself inspired, to keep yourself creative. Like what's your workflow like on a daily basis? Yeah, I don't really work off of schedule because I'm always in a different, I yeah. don't know, depending on what I'm working on. I, right now I'm balancing a whole bunch of projects. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to be in New York working on a project with Toyota at the end of the month, which is a car wrap and a mural. Uh, working on something in Miami with Joe and the Juice, um, which is a mural and, and products and things like that. Um I just did an NFT release this morning, which I illustrated myself. Awesome. And um, 
I'm working with a private client to paint a 50,000 square foot footprint of a building, like the whole entire bottom floor. And Damn. yeah, just like lots of upcoming exhibitions and things like that. And for example, yesterday, um, I went out and just dug holes in dirt for like five hours. <laughs> it's, like, it's like your mental, mental health. You could just go dig holes for a and little bit. And I was bit. like, Ooh, came home and like, you know, relax. And it's like, that probably wasn't what I should have done, but it was what I needed to do, you know? And yeah, uh, <laughs> um, yeah it's always interesting. I mean, I feel really lucky and grateful that I have, um, that I'm self-employed and that I get to choose my own schedule. And sometimes I like to work at night and sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I just, um, I really, what I do like though is crunch time and deadlines. I think that works really well for me. Like on a wall, you know, you don't want to leave a mural halfway done because it looks really bad in process. Yeah. But if I'm in my studio, I can sit there for months and I don't really care unless I've got a deadline or an exhibition or something. But so, you know, depending on the project, I'll bounce between working on my computer and creating something on Photoshop and then I'll get an idea and want to work something out on canvas or watercolor or whatever. Then maybe I'll go in the garden and take some photos of plants or go to a botanical garden and take some photos to incorporate in that. And just, I don't know, I, I kind of um, work in a really weird, you know, I ha I'm like getting into stained glass and like weird things. And uh, I would say I work very unconventionally. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like that. I mean, I, I prefer that. I think I, I know schedules are, are are really important for some people as far as like, um, you know, maintaining like a work life balance, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to work mm -hmm. from this moment to this. But it, honestly, if if like a work life balance isn't really fucking with you that much a free flow work state of just being an artist and going from one project to the next. And sometimes you wake up early and paint. Sometimes you're up yeah. all night, you know, some like, yeah, that's, that's kind of where the juice is for me, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, the thing is I'm not used to having a little bat cave. Actually. I'm used to just bouncing from project to project and working on the road. And so I would really like to develop the habit of doing more studio work in a more disciplined manner. But I think you have to allow for yourself to be like, if I'm not in the mood, I'm not gonna force it. But during Corona, actually, when it first started March 17th, I was supposed to fly to Australia. And at that time I was in my studio in LA and I canceled the trip because I was like, this is weird. And I, you know, all my projects got canceled suddenly. And I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm gonna do. So in order to kind of push myself, I created this thing called Corona Creates. And I forced myself to paint on Facebook Live from, I think it was 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. every single day. And so it was as if being on a mural because people were watching. I couldn't just sit on a couch and go through yeah, Instagram yeah, yeah, yeah. and hang out. So it kind of forced me to be disciplined. And I ended up creating a lot of pieces like this one and a lot of really big, large scale pieces. And I was really happy with the progression because I was working every single day in a really disciplined manner. But I didn't like necessarily being on the video and like all of that but it's funny and I think important to figure out tricks to push yourself as a creative because art and being creative is amazing but if you're not working at it you're not going to progress and if you're not actually putting the time in you're not going to get anywhere and it really does take a lot of thorough thoroughness and revisions and reworking things I'm sure you know that as a musician just like keeping at it and practicing and pushing it and not being happy with things. I mean, like, okay, the next one's going to be amazing. And that's how you keep evolving as an artist. And it's really important. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And that's kind of what, you know, what like the life is all about, you know, it's, it's about pushing yourself and, 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 you know, wanting to go further and wanting to try new things and not, you know, allowing yourself to get lazy or boxed in or, or comfortable with yeah. what you do, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's cool that you did that. I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing to do it on, on live too, where people can kind of watch and interact. It's like, it, it's, it's cool. It's, is it nerve wracking too doing stuff like that? I mean, I'm used to painting in public, so not really. Oh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. More than anything, I felt like I was so isolated. I'm sure a lot of other people were feeling really isolated and I feel pretty stable, but it was so hard that I'm sure a lot of people were struggling. And so I was like, let's make a community and everyone should share and create work together. And so it was this open invitation to kind of create work together in a studio instead of being really isolated and I think that was really nice yeah that makes a lot of sense the uh the pandemic was 
super gnarly at first, especially for a lot of yeah. people, you know, yeah. it hit like a ton of bricks and all of a sudden, you know, you were just kind of stuck and it was like, okay, you know, I think for a lot of people, uh, you know, the voices in their head or, you know, kind of started fucking with them a little bit, you know, about yeah. life and where they're going and what they've done yeah. and all this stuff. So any sort of outlet that you can kind of, you know, watch or be a part of a community, uh, you know, was, was really big, you know, yeah. because especially in the beginning with all that shit that was going on in the States too, with all the protests and everything, I was fucking yeah. oh, nuts. So much. Yo. So I, I was like in my LA studio to start, but I barely had windows, you know, I had a couple small windows, the parks were all closed. I lived on a freeway and I did, I lived by myself. And so I didn't talk to someone for like a month or two. And at the time I had a partner, you know, in Northern California. So I was like, you know, he was like, I'll build you a, a painting wall on the farm. So I was like, sweet, let me do that. So I sublet my apartment and that chick turned into a squatter. I was like, I'm not paying. I'm not leaving. Also, if you don't pay me $7,000 by 2 PM, I'm going to set this painting on fire. And it was just this horrific experience. And then my New York apartment, the chick was like, Hey, Elle, I don't think I can pay rent anymore. And I was like, no, 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 no. I can't pay for three apartments a month that I'm not living in. So I had to get rid of that apartment, lost LA. And suddenly I was like, I'm homeless. And getting threatened by this. Like it was such yeah. a crazy experience. And so trying to navigate that and like stay sane and create work is like everyone had the craziest experiences though, you know, and nobody knows, nobody even knew what was going on with anyone. Cause it's just like, everyone was trying to deal with their own things so much that I feel like we were all like, just, you're going to make it tomorrow's another day. <laughs> You know. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think it took everyone a while to figure it out, too, because it was like, you know, most artists when the pandemic hit, everyone was just like, OK, here we go. I'm going to write the greatest record ever. I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? Like you were probably like, OK, I'm going to get I'm going to knock all this shit out. I'm gonna do and, and, and I think a lot of people found it harder, you know, to really like, even though you had all the time in the world, suddenly it was really hard to kind of to, to channel that, that inspiration. Cause it was just like, a, it was, it was a weird time. It was a really yeah. weird time. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, I was protesting and making protest signs and my energy yeah. was getting focused into things of just feeling like I was in survival mode of like, yeah. okay, we need to save humanity. And yeah, there's a lot going on. You know, yeah. I think, yeah. I think in a certain way you have to be able to in order to really create truthfully and honestly, you have to be in this place of full comfort, no fear in a way, and just be like open-hearted and feel totally secure in your state of being and be able to just drop in. And that's really hard when you feel like the world is crumbling around you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really is. You know, and it's like, and it, it's tough too, you know, when, you know, you are, are very much in tune as an artist to, the you know your world immediately but your city your state uh and, and the world at large too i mean you've done a mm -hmm. lot of traveling you know mm -hmm. as an artist you've got work in you know europe you've got work you know on coast to coast all around the world australia yeah. Yeah. um as the world's kind of opening back up you know are you excited to do a little bit more traveling and and get back to some of those spots because I... we're, go we're going to australia in may and i can't wait <laughs> Nice. I'll be there in October. It's so beautiful. Um, yeah. I'll let you know where to go if you if you don't have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet, yet. yet. Um, I actually was just in Europe last month though, and I was doing Amsterdam, and then I was going to be in Berlin for a bit, and um, it was actually really tough still with COVID because uh, um, Amsterdam at that point was having the biggest spike that they've ever had, and so all the projects like you know a lot of people had to cancel things because they had COVID and they had to, to quarantine. And then, you know, I was, I had to get within 24 hours, you'd have to get a COVID test. So you'd have to try to Google in another language, like where do I get the emergency COVID test and try to find that and get there. And, you know, I was like, what do you do if you get COVID and you're on the road for job and then suddenly you have to quarantine for two weeks and if you don't test negative. And so it just gets really kind of difficult. And I was like, maybe this is too soon, but I'm, I'm already feeling like it's better. This is a month later and everything was spiking crazy then with Omicron, Omicrap. <laughs> and, um, so I don't know. I don't know, man. I, I wish we could just at this point, I just, I'm so over it. I just, I'm like, can we just stop quarantining and everything? Let's just call it a day. I think we're yeah. done. Yeah, I'm, done. I, 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 I'm so I'm so over it. I'm so, so, over. so I'm so over it. You know, it's like, and the crazy thing with music is like, 
you know, now it's like finally starting to come back to the point where, you know, festivals and things like that are, 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 are dropping a lot of like mask mandates and things like that. But it's also, there's also a weird thing where it's like, that's all great and all, but if, if you're touring and like a, someone in the band or whatever, like gets COVID, like, what do you, like, do you still have to just shut everything down? Like there's still yeah. so much to kind of like, yeah. it's like, ah. Tough. I know. Yeah. It, I literally it, it got sucks. back and was like, I'm going to keep working on the bat cave a bit. I think it's going to be around a bit longer, yeah. but I do think eventually it'll, it'll be, it'll be great again. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're in your bunker. You're locked down. You're, you're good to go. <laughs> I'm like, let's get the creative juices flowing. <laughs> uh, speaking of creative juices, uh, music and art, you know, they, they pretty much go hand in hand. Uh, what, what kind of music do you fuck with? Do you listen to music when you're working? Definitely all the time. Um, but I also mix in podcasts because I honestly get sick of my playlist because my job allows me to listen to music 24 seven, um, which I love, but I, li- I think I listen to very eclectic things. I like world music. I like jungle music. Um, I don't really dis well, yeah, there are a couple of things I don't like, but I'd say generally I'm pretty eclectic in my music taste. Do you find it easier to work with music that is more like uh, beat oriented and, and not so much uh, like music without lyrics? Because sometimes it's hard when yeah. you, for your brain to like, you know, you got someone talking or you got, you know, something else happening. It's, it, it's yeah. nice to just kind of work with, with beats and background music. A hundred percent, especially because half of my work is actually on a computer because I don't have a manager or anything. So I end up doing a lot of contracts and emails and all these yeah. things. And so yeah, exactly. It's like anything that kind of can be in the background and um, not super distracting, but also allows me to flow. And I think that's why I'm really, I'm one of those people that drives other people crazy because I will listen to my playlist on repeat 8,000 times and people will be like, you need to change this song. But I think that kind of enables me to be in a flow and I can just sing along with the entire, you know, 20 hours and be like, good. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if it works for you, you know, fuck it, you know, (laughs) totally. But yeah, it's funny. I mean, I love, I love, love music. And that really enables me to kind of get like, you know, putting on candles and making the the lights really nice. And then, you know, putting on the nice music and then just really dropping into the zone and turning my phone off and trying to allow for very few distractions, I think is important. Um, But yeah, music is definitely a big part of that. Right on, right on. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time here, Elle. I really appreciate you being on the podcast. Um, you, you know, you are uh, a, a badass female artist. You've done, you know, graffiti, street art, murals, large scale work, small scale work, independent, doing your own, basically being your own manager, all that stuff. You know, now is a kind of a crazy time for artists coming up. It's kind of like the world is at their fingertips and you can kind of do whatever you want, but Uh, A lot of times that's tough because it's still you're faced with, you know, a blank canvas. You don't really know what to do first. What is some of the advice that you might give some up and coming artists um, out there today? Yeah, sure. I think it's really easy to be overwhelmed, firstly, Mm -hmm. by (laughs) just like everything uh, being an artist. But um, I like making a lot of lists to-do lists and just, you know, knocking things off a list always makes me feel really good. So even if it's a creative thing, you know, okay, I'm going to spend, start small, you know, I'm going to spend 30 minutes a day being creative without any distractions, or I'm going to do two hours every other day, or one hour at night, just blocking out little bits of time to start chipping away. Because I think it can be really overwhelming to be like, I want to create an album, or I want to create an exhibition when instead you just really need to put time in. And so if you can, work out little pieces of time. I think that's really important. Um, Other advice. I mean, if you're a starting out artist, I often advise don't depend on your art or your creative thing for money, because the amount of stress and pressure that that puts on the art and, and the creativity, I think is is really hard for the process. I would highly recommend getting a bartending job or getting a side hustle and creating art on your side uh, you know, on the side so that you really can create whatever you want to be creating as an artist and not feel like, oh, I sold one piece that sort of looked like this, or I made a, a song that sounded like this. So I think if I make something else that sounds just like that, maybe I can sell it or feeling pressured in some weird way to create something that might not really be what you feel as an artist. I think listening to that intuition is super, super important. And so unless you really feel like you have that freedom and grasp of being able to 
make what you want to make as an artist. Um, you know, don't depend on it for money, if that makes sense. I'd say that yeah. those are my main mean things yeah absolutely absolutely that's really cool what do you got uh coming up in 2022 what's on your radar this year yeah so i think i am getting back to australia finally i'm a permanent resident there actually i spent their painting <laughs> yeah and um traded a lawyer to do a thing i'm like yeah i got a special talent <laughs> visa <laughs> i painted his office and awesome. um yeah, uh, so I think I'll do an exhibition out there in October and I'll be in Miami and New York for projects. Um, I plan on doing a lot more NFT work. I really, I think it's really fun. You know, I think it feels really wild to me. Yeah, I love yeah, yeah. that like unregulated space. I love that unregulated idea. I hope to buy some property in, the, in crypto voxels. Um, Yes, yeah, so I guess like hitting the road, but also really focusing on studio work. I really um, do want to take advantage of the time that I'm not on the road this year and really try to develop and push. Um, I don't know if it's canvases so much. I honestly feel like it might be. I really want to move into sculpture and that's it's really intimidating for me because I don't know how to make sculpture. <laughs> so I have this big vision and I've had visions and I, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like creating it you know I should take my own advice like 30 minutes a day work on the sculpture um but it's like in my mind that's really where I want to get to and I feel like I've been working through all these processes and blocks to try to get there so that's the ultimate goal of 2022 that's awesome that's really cool it just starts with a vision you know so yeah yeah you got that already so hopefully <laughs> you get some time to start in on sculptures that'll be really awesome yeah I hope so um, right on yeah. Yeah. I just got all sorts of like neon bending equipment and stuff like that. So I'm really Ooh, excited. Cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. Last question. Uh, it's a little bit of a doozy. Uh, you know, what to you as an artist, as a human being, what do you think the meaning of life is? Oh, the meaning of life. I really do feel like it's about love connection and creativity. I mean, it's about diving deep and creating authentic connections. Different people do it in different ways, but I think that's the ultimate. Right on, Elle. Thank you yeah. so much for your time. Really yeah. appreciate you being on the podcast. It's so great chatting with you. Thank you so much. Right on. All right. I hope to meet you soon in person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You too. Rad. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh yeah, that's a wrap on episode 32 of the Sailor Jerry podcast. As always, ladies and gentlemen, huge amounts of gratitude to our guest, the one and only L. L, thank you very much for your time. It was really cool getting to talk with you. Uh, we really appreciate you and your work and nothing but continued success in the future. Uh, you could follow L at L Street Art on Instagram. Uh, you could follow me at 213 Matt Man. Of course, you're already following Sailor Jerry. Uh, don't forget, okay? Whatever you do, just don't forget that Sailor Jerry Spiced Rum is made the old school way. 92 proof, bold and smooth as hell. Rest in peace, Scott Hall, a.k.a. Razor Ramon. I got an extra week off, so I'll see you guys in 21 days. Peace. <laughs>